the first question, it's uh, asked by Tarun, and uh, he asks, I understand that the I thought comes into existence when it attaches itself to an object, thus fattening this illusory I. I don't understand where these objects are coming from. Uh, where these objects are coming from, that the I thought incessantly clings on to. It appears these objects exist independent of the I thought. Furthermore, why does the I thought find it so difficult to cling on to itself? Is it because it likes to suffer? Surely it doesn't. Some clarification would be greatly appreciated. Um, it's first necessary to be clear um, what Bhagavan means by the term I thought and um, why he says it is a thought. Yeah, but the term Bhagavan uses in Tamil generally is uh, nan enam ninevu. That literally means the thought called I. Um, in the Sanskrit, he, uh, in, um, in Upadesh Saram, he refers to it as, um, um, as aham vritti, which literally means I thought. Um, what Bhagavan refers to as the thought called I or the I thought, is nothing but ego. Why does he uh, say that it is a thought? Because according to him, everything other than our real nature, there's everything other than pure awareness is just a thought. That is our real nature is just pure awareness, which is just awareness of our own existence, I am. Anything other than that is mental in nature and therefore is a thought. But when uses the thought, term thought in a very broad sense to mean any mental phenomenon. So uh, according to Bhagavan, everything other than pure awareness is just a thought. Um, it's, uh, this is, Bhagavan makes this clear in, um, in several places in uh, Nana. In the 14th paragraph of Nana, he says um, towards the end, Jagam, uh, uh, Sorry, um, Jagam Embadu Nineve. That means what is called the world is nothing but thought. And he says, uh, likewise, in the fourth paragraph, he says, Nineve Gule Elam Niki Parkindra Podu Tanei Manam Endro Porolile. That is, uh, if, if we, uh, when, we, when we see removing all thoughts, Separately, there's no such thing as mind. As, as, as sorry, no, sorry, I read the wrong sentence. Um, oh, oh, sorry, I read the wrong sentence. Sorry, uh, what he says, Nene Rugale Tabitu, Jagam Endro Porul Aniamai Ile. That means uh, uh, um, uh, excluding thoughts, there is not separately any such thing as world. So according to Bhagavan, all, all phenomena are just thoughts or mental phenomena, even though the world appears to be physical phenomena, consists of physical phenomena, those physical phenomena are nothing but thoughts. Just as in a dream, when we, we see what seems to be a physical world, but actually it's all just a mental, pre, a mental projection. Bhagavan says, likewise, this world is just a mental projection. And he gives in this paragraph, he gives the um, analogy, or, or I'll continue reading what he says. He's uh, saying excluding thought, there's not separately any such thing as world. He says in the next sentence, in sleep there are no thoughts and there is also no world. In waking and dream there are thoughts and there is also world. That means uh, the world is nothing, he's emphasizing there, world is nothing but thoughts. And then he gives an analogy. Just as a spider spins out thread from within itself and again draws it back into itself, so the mind makes the world appear from within itself and again dissolves it back into itself. So uh, the world is nothing but thoughts. All physical phenomena are nothing but mental phenomena, in other words. Um, so uh, since they're thoughts, they don't exist independent of ego. Um, in the fifth paragraph, uh, Bhagavan um, explains this very clearly. He says, um, um, uh, Manadil uh, Tondrum Nene Vugale Elava Trikum, 
nanenum ninebe mudal ninebu. That means of all the thoughts that appear or arise in the mind, the thought called I alone is the first thought. Uh, that's the primal thought or uh, mudal means uh, first, primal, basic, original or causal thought. So it, it, uh, the, thought, the thought called I is the first of all thoughts and only after it arises, other thoughts rise. Uh, and as he says in the next sentence, Idu uh, erunda um, pirahe enia ninevugolal erukindrana. That is, only after this arises do other thoughts arise. And then he says the same in the next two sentences, but instead of using the term uh, thought called I, he refers it to the ego as the first person. Only after the first person appears do second and third persons appear. Without the first person, second and third persons do not exist. That means without the first thought I, nothing else exists. Uh, nothing else means nothing other than pure awareness exists. That is, pure awareness is the soul, is the screen, the soul basis on which everything appears. The first thing to appear is the ego, the thought called I. Only after the thought called I, the, the ego appears, do all other things appear. Why is that? Because the thought called I is the subject, the perceiver. And if all other thoughts are objects or things perceived by it. So things that are perceived cannot exist independent of the perceiver. They exist only in the, per in the perception of the perceiver. Um, so this is, the, this is the, the, the fundamental teaching of Bhagavan. Um, also in the um, eighth paragraph, a few sentences that are worth reading, um, he says, um, uh, Nineve uh, manatin sarupam, that is, thought alone is the nature of the mind. Nanenum nineve manatin mudal nenevu, thought called I uh, alone is the uh, first thought of the mind. In, of the mind. Iduve ahankaram, this alone is ego. So, what he means by the, the first thought I is ego, and that is, uh, and it is only. only uh, that is the, the first of all thoughts. So it's only after that arises that all other thoughts arise. Um, in Urdu Napdu, he also explains this very clearly. Um, to, just to relate this back to your question, you start by asking, I understand that I thought comes into existence when it attaches itself to an, ob an object and thus fattening this illusory I. That is basically a summary of what Bhagavan says in verse 25 of Urdu Napadu. <coughs> um, what he says there is, um, he, uh, the subject of this verse, he, he gives actually at the, in the last line, Uruvatra Peya Hande. Uh, Uru, Uruvatra Peya Hande means the formless phantom ego. That is, ego is formless because it has no form of its own, and it's a phantom because it's got no substance of its own. Um, so, how this formless, this something, something that has neither form nor substance, how can it come into, how can it exist? He says, Urupatri uh, undam, grasping form, it uh, comes into existence. Urupatri uh, nikkum, grasping form, it stands. Urupatri undu mika ongom, grasping and uh, feeding on forms, it grows abundantly. Uruvitu urupatrum, leaving one form, it grasps another form. Tedinal otum pidicum, if sought, it takes flight. That is, ego has no form of its own, but so, it, but so it cannot seem to exist without grasping a form as itself. So ego comes into existence grasping a form of a body as I, and then through the five senses of that uh, body, it grasps other forms, and by grasping forms, it feeds on them. So how does this formless phantom ego grasp forms? It grasps them, what Bhagavan means by patri, grasping, is um, it, 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 it is aware of them. By being aware of them, by grasping them in its awareness, it, um, it, 
it, it comes into existence, it stands and it flourishes. Um, it's, it, it, reading this, it may appear that the thought forms exist independent of ego, but the fact that forms don't exist independent of ego is made very clear by him in the next verse, verse 26, in which he says, if ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. Ego itself is everything. That is, nothing exists independent of ego. So the forms that ego grasps are, are, um, are it grasps them, as I say, by being aware of them. But how is it aware of them? By projecting them in its awareness. In, when we dream, we experience a dream body as I. But that dream body doesn't exist independent of our awareness of it. It is, we, we project it and grasp it as I. And we, likewise, we project the, the dream world and we're aware of it as if it's existing outside ourself, independent of ourselves. Exactly, according to Bhagavan, our present state is just a dream. So we project this dream, um, uh, uh, we project this dream body, grasp it as us uh, in our awareness, experiences it as uh, ourself, and through the five senses of that body, we project a world. So all these things actually exist within us. They don't exist independent of us at all. They exist, they seem to exist only because we're aware of them. So, um, uh, Bhagavan's uh, 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 basic teaching is what is called Drishti Shristi Vada. Drishti means seeing or perceiving, and Shristi means creation. Shristi, sorry, Drishti Shristi Vada is in contrast, uh, in contrast to Shristi Drishti Vada. Shristi Drishti Vada means first there's creation and then we perceive it. That is most. Um, religious and scientific theories believe the world exists independent of ourselves. So first it's created and then we come along and we are, well, we are created as part of it and we perceive it. Whereas according to Bhagavan, the, there is no creation independent of our perception of it. So just as in a dream, the dream doesn't exist independent of our perception of it. This waking world doesn't exist independent of our perception of it. Um, as I say, but in this verse 25, Bhagavan refers to ego as Urupatra Payahande, the formless phantom ego. Formless because it has no form of its own, so it cannot come into existence without grasping the form of a body as I. Uh, pay it means uh, phantom. A phantom has no substance of its own. So the, the substance of ego is awareness. The form is the body. Ego is neither the, the, the body nor the awareness, but it's, a, uh, it's um, something that rises in between them, as he says in the previous verse, verse 24. There he says, Jada Udal Nan Enadu. That literally means the insentient body do, does not say I. But here he, he's using word say in a metaphorical sense. What that implies is the, ins the body is insentient, so it's not aware of its own existence. It's not aware of itself as I. Um, and in the next sentence, he says, Satchit Udiyadu. Satchit does not rise. That being awareness does not rise. And then in the next sentence, he says, Udal um, Alava Nan Ondru Udikum Ideal. Ideal literally means in between. In between, one thing, I, rises as the extent of the body. When he says in between, that is, he obviously doesn't mean it literally because uh, Satchit is the sole reality. So there's not Satchit on one side and uh, an insentient body on the other side and an ego rising in between. You shouldn't take it literally like that. He uses in between in a metaphorical sense. Uh, this is best illustrated by saying, if, um, if you read a, a story in a newspaper and you ask me, is it true? I may say it's neither true nor false, but somewhere in between. What does that mean? 
That means it's got elements of truth, it's got elements of falsehood. So it's neither completely true nor is it completely false. It's somewhere in between. It's a mixture of both. It's mixing up um, uh, some true elements and some false elements and uh, concocting a story. Ego is like that. It is neither the neither is ego the judge of body, body nor is it satchit, but it partakes of the quality of both. The judge udal, the, the insentient body, is the form that it grasps. The satchit is the substance. But the reason Bhagavan says ego is a formless phantom is it's neither the form of the body, nor is it the real substance, satchit. But it borrows qualities of both. Like satchit, it's aware. Like the body is limited uh, within, as Bhagavan says, it rises to the extent of a body. That means it, the body is limited in time and space. Uh, ego, when we, as, when we rise as ego, we experience ourselves as a body which is limited in time and space. So we seem to be limited in time and space. It seems we were born um, X number of years before and some years hence we're going to die. So we're limited in time. We are here, not there. We're limited at a certain point in space. So as ego, we always experience ourselves limited to the form of a body. But unlike the body, which is jada, which has no awareness of its own, we are aware of ourselves, and we're aware of ourselves as I. But awareness of ourselves as I is the quality of satchit. So we are mixing the qualities of the body and satchit, and we're, we're claiming both the satchit and the body as, as ourself. Uh, then in the next sentence of this uh, verse, Bhagavan says, Idu, uh, Chit jada granti bandam jivan nupame ahande ichamsaram manam eni. That means uh, uh, know that this is the chit jada granti. Chit jada granti means the not, of a, the, chit means awareness, jada means what is not insentient, what is not aware, and granti means not. So it's the not formed by the entanglement of chit and jada. Jada is the body, chit is satchit, the, the real awareness. So when these two are seemingly bound together, they get entangled and form a knot. The knot is not, if, if you have a, a knot formed of two pieces of string, let's say there are two colored pieces of string, a green string and a red string. If you, if you knot these two strings together, the knot is neither the green string nor is it red string. It is something formed by the entanglement of both. Likewise, ego is neither the body nor is it such it. Um, so uh, it is uh, this this uh, this I that rises between such it and and body or the, the rises taking the qualities of both is chit jadagranti. It is bandham that means bondage, jivan that's jiva or soul, nupame the subtle body. Uh, here Bhagavan uses subtle body in a slightly different way to the way it's usually used in sastras, where it's um, uh, two or three of the five sheaths are called subtle body. Here Bhagavan is using terms subtle body to refer to ego, uh, because according to Bhagavan, all the five sheaths are gross. The ego is the, is the subtle body. That's how he's using the term here. Ahande, ahande means ego. Ichamsaram, which means this samsara. Uh, mind. So this I that rises, identifying a body, experiencing itself both as awareness and as a, this insentient body, that is chit jadagranti, bondage, jiva, subtle body, ego, samsara, and mind. Um, that is why in the next verse he refers to it as a, as a, as, as a formless phantom, because it's formless because it's not actually the, the body that it identifies as I. Though it always identifies the body as I, that is not what it actually is. It is also a, a phantom because it has no substance of its own. Though it, 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 it couldn't exist without the real substance, which is satchit, that satchit doesn't belong to it. Just as it's taking the body as itself, it's taking the satchit as itself, but it is neither the body nor satchit. That is, satchit is what is always shiny as I am, our, our fundamental awareness of our own existence. Um, 
ego is neither that fundamental awareness of our own existence, I am, nor is it the body. It is the, it is, uh, the not that is formed when these two become entangled. In other words, it's the false awareness, I am this body. So, so long as we are aware of ourselves as I am this body, that which is aware of itself thus, that is ego. And as he says in verse 25, it, uh, grasping form, it comes into existence, grasping form, it stands, and grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes. So by being aware of forms means phenomena, all phenomena are forms, all uh, forms are phenomena. So that means because the ego is uh, uh, formless, the forms that it grasps are, are things other than itself. So everything other than, than it, all objects, all phenomena, uh, what Bhagavan is referring to here is Uru, for, form. So grasping form, it uh, comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes. Uru vittu, uru patram. Leaving one form, it grasps another form. Tedinal otum pidicum. If sought, it takes flight. Why is that? E because ego exists only by, only so long as it's grasping form, if it tries to grasp itself, if it tries to be aware of itself alone, it thereby dissolves and disappears because it is formless, it has no form of its own. So if we try to investigate ourselves, who am I? If we try to turn our attention back within to see who is this I who is aware, who am now aware of myself as I am this body, this, this I dissolves and disappears because we seem to be ego only so long as we're grasping form. Grasping form means looking at other things, attending to things other than ourselves. When we try to attend to ourselves, we're thereby letting go of the form and trying to hold on to the formless phantom called ego. That formless phantom, uh, otum pidicum, it takes flight, as Bhagavan says uh, metaphorically. In other words, it dissolves and disappears. So this is the nature of ego. And that is why in the next verse, verse 26, as I said, Bhagavan says, this, because Bhagavan always emphasizes that this ego is the root of everything. As he said in that passage of Nana that I read, uh, of all the thoughts that arise in the mind, the thought called I is the first. Since all phenomena are thoughts, that means the root of all phenomena is only this ego. Why? Because ego is the subject and phenomena are all objects perceived by it. So the objects seem to exist only because of, of the subject, because of the seeming, only when we rise as ego do we, uh, and thereby see other things, do those other things seem to exist. So, a hande undayin, a netum undahum. If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. A hande indrail, indra netum. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. A hande yavamam. Ego itself is everything. That is all the phenomena that we see, all the forms that we see, then they, in substance, they're nothing but ego. Because the ego is the first thought, these are just other thoughts. So, they're, they're in their. The, the root of the mind is ego. All other forms that we see are just mental creation. So they're all in substance, only ego. Um, though they, ego is always sees them as things other than itself, their substance is nothing but mental, which is the name, and the source of all mental, the root of all mental things is ego. So Bhagavan says, uh, ego itself is everything. So all the forms we see, and nothing but a, an expansion of our self as ego. Um, and then in the next sentence, a very important sentence, he says, Adalal yadu idu endu nadale ovadal yavam ena or. Therefore, know that investigating what this is, is giving up everything. What this is means what this ego is. Why is investigating what the ego is giving up everything? Because as he said in the previous sentence, Tedinal Otum Pidicum. If we seek it, it takes flight. So if we begin to investigate who am I, we, we are thereby giving up everything. Because the more we cling to I, the more we're letting go of everything else. And the more we cling to I, the more of this I as ego dissolves back into its source. And without ego, nothing else can exist. So by investigating ego, we are giving up everything. So the ultimate renunciation, the ultimate surrender is only self-investigation. So I hope this, um, this answers your question. Your first question was, 
but I understand that ego comes into existence when it attaches itself to, to an object. I don't understand where these objects are coming from. Well, the answer to that is they're coming only from ego because it's, they're all ego's own projection. Ego, just as in a dream, but all, all the phenomena seen in a dream, where are they coming from? They're only coming from the dreamer. The dreamer is projecting them and seeing them. That is the, the, it, the very act of perception is, it, I mean, percep the projection and the perception are not two different things because where are we projecting it? We're projecting it within our own awareness. So, the, so creation and uh, perception are not two different things. We create the world by perceiving it. In other words, we project it into our awareness like a dream, uh, just as we do in a dream. Um, so where the objects are coming from is only from the first thought called I, in other words, ego. Um, uh, you, you say it appears these objects exist independent of the I thought. Yes, when we see the world, it seems to, to us to exist independent of us. We assume, but that actually only, us. if we think about it deeply, we have no reason to suppose that anything we perceive exists independent of our perception of it. It's just an assumption that this world exists independent of our perception of it. Why does it seem to be independent of our perception of it? Uh, consider a dream. In a dream, so long as we are dreaming, the dream world seems to exist outside ourselves. It seems to be something existing independent of ourselves. It seems to be real. But as soon as we wake up, we recognize that it's not real, that it existed only in our own mind. It didn't exist independent of ourselves. What is the change that takes place between the time when we're dreaming and the time when we wake up? While we are dreaming, we are experiencing the dream body as I. What is real in the dream is only I. But because we take, we experience a dream body as I, that dream body seems to be real. And because the dream body is a part of the dream world, the whole dream world seems to be real. So the reality that a dream seems to have, so long as we're perceiving it, is, is a reality, it, it's our own reality, but we, we, we project onto the world. Because we take the body as I, the body seems to be real. And because the body is a part of the world, the whole world seems to be real. As soon as the dream comes to an end and we come to this so-called waking state, which is according to Bhagavan is just another dream, our identification with that dream body is severed. We no longer experience that dream body as I. As soon as we cease to experience that dream body as I, we're able to clearly recognize that what seemed to be existing independent of ourself actually was existed only within ourselves. It was only our own mental creation. It was just a dream. But so long as we're dreaming, it seems to be real. It seems to be waking. Um, and then your next question, furthermore, why does this, the I thought find it so difficult to cling on to itself? The, the reason is because of our, the strength of our Vishaya Vasanas. Uh, Vishaya Vasanas means our inclination to be aware of Vishaya. Vishaya means um, phenomena or what Bhagavan calls Uru, the forms that it's grasping. They are all Vishaya. Because of our inclination to be aware of these forms, we are unwilling to let go of them as Bhagavan says it, to investigate who am I, we need to let go of everything else. We can't hold on to ourself alone without thereby letting go of everything else. To the extent to which we hold on to ourself, to that extent we are letting go of everything else. So until we are willing to let go of everything else, not just temporarily, but permanently, we will not be willing, we'll be reluctant to cling only to ourselves. So, um, uh, we, that reluctance is because of our desire and attachment, the seeds of which are our Vishaya Vasanas. And you ask, is it because ego likes to suffer? No, ego, obviously as ego, we don't like to suffer. We're all seeking happiness. We all want to be free of suffering. But because of our attachment to things, it seems to us that we derive happiness from, uh, from things other than ourselves, from sensual pleasures, from um, intellectual pleasures, all these things are other than ourselves. Whatever, whatever we derive pleasure from, we're deriving, we, 
well, whatever we seem to derive pleasure from, those things are other than ourselves. According to Bhagavan, there's no happiness at all in any of these, in any phenomena. As he says in the, uh, elsewhere in the 14th paragraph of Nana, there's, there's no happiness at all in any of the uh, uh, things of the world. Um, happiness is uh, our real nature. But because of we wrongly associate, uh, because when we, when we desire something and get what we desire, desire is an agitation of our mind. Desire is a thought agitating our mind. When the desire is satisfied, briefly, the mind is pacified. The agitation is pacified. So we seem to experience happiness. But where does that happiness come from? It comes only from within ourselves. So because of our avivaka, because we wrongly uh, uh, um, mistake happiness to be coming from external things, we are unwilling to let go of them. And we, so we want to continue seeking happiness in them. Um, so you're right, ego doesn't want to suffer, but it's looking for happiness in the wrong place. It's looking for happiness outside itself. It's looking for happiness outside of itself because of its vishaya vasana. So how to overcome this, um, this attachment that we have to, uh, how to overcome our vishaya vasanas? Very simply, as Bhagavan explains in um, the 10th and 11th paragraph of, uh, of, Nan, of Nana, um, um, as he says there, even though vishaya vasanas that come from time immemorial, rise in countless numbers like ocean waves, they will all be destroyed when Swarupa Dhyana increases and increases. Swarupa Dhyana literally means meditation on our own real nature. That means self-attentiveness uh, self or self-contemplation, in other words, self-investigation. It's a synonym for Atmavichara. Without giving room even to the doubting thoughts, so many vasanas ceasing, is it possible to be only a Swarupa, my own real nature? Um, it's necessary to cling tenaciously to uh, self-attentiveness. He says it in Tamil, he says it very strongly. Vida pidi pidi kavendum. That's a very, very strong way of saying, the, literally vida pidi means um, um, uh, unleavingly, clingingly, clinging to, it's necessary to cling unleavingly clingingly. It's a very strong way of saying it. Vidā pidiyāi. Vidā means without leaving. Pidiyāi means uh, clingingly. Pidika means to cling. Vendum is necessary. It's necessary to cling uh, tenaciously. That's the best way we can say it in English. To cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness. The more we cling to self-attentiveness, the more the vāsanas will, uh, will lose their strength and will eventually be destroyed. And then in the next sentence, he says, however great a sinner one might be, if instead of lamenting and weeping, I am a sinner, how, how am I going to be saved? One completely rejects the thought that one is a sinner and is steadfast in self-attentiveness, one will certainly be reformed. And then in the next paragraph, he says, as long as the share of asanas exist in the mind, that's as long as we have an inclination to attend to anything other than ourselves, so long is the investigation, who am I necessary? As and when thoughts appear, then and there it is necessary to annihilate them all by vicharana, in the very place from which, we, uh, from which they arise. That is, by clinging to self-attentiveness, we are thereby annihilating the, um, the vishayavasanas. That is, because the vishayavasanas are trying to pull us away from ourselves. There are inclinations to go away from ourselves. If we yield to them, we'll go out after attending to whatever other thing. But if we, to, the more we cling to I, we are not yielding to the Vishaya Vasanas, so they are losing their strength. Um, and then in the next sentence, he says, not attending, uh, um, uh, I'll read the sentence in Tamil, An Aniyate Nada Dirtal. Vairagyam aldunerase. That means um, um, uh, not attending to anything other than oneself is vairagya or nirasa. Vairagya means, vairagya and nirasa mean more or less the same. Uh, vairagya we can translate as dispassion or detachment. Nirasa literally means desirelessness. Um, and then in the next uh, sentence he said, uh, 
Tane vida dirito nyanam. Not leaving oneself is nyana. Um, in truth, these two, that means varagya and nyana, are one and the same. So by clinging to ourselves, not leaving ourselves, that is varagya, because we're not attending to other things. Um, and then he gives an analogy, just as pearl divers tying stones to their waist and sinking, pick up pearls that are lying at the bottom of the ocean, so each one, sinking deep within oneself with varagya, um, may obtain the pearl of uh, the abmamutu, the pearl of, uh, of our of self, of our real nature. Um, so the, how do we sink deep within ourselves? Just like the pearl diver ties a stone to his waist in order to dive deep, we have to tie the stone of Bairagya. That is, uh, we need to be free of desire to attend to other things. And then only we can sink deep within ourselves. Now we don't have sufficient Bairagya, but the more we persevere in, in trying to cling firmly to self-attentiveness, the more our, our Vishaya Vasanas will be weakened and our Bairagya will thereby be strengthened. And then in the next sentence, he says, uh, this is a very uh, beautiful and very important sentence. Oruvan tan sarupate adeyam varil nirantara sarupa smaranei kai patruvanayin adu andre podom. That means if one clings to uninterrupted swarupa smarana, until one attains swarupa, one's own real nature, that alone is sufficient. What does swarupa smarana mean? Literally, smarana means remembrance. So swarupa smarana is self-remembrance or remembrance of our real nature. In other words, it's the same as swarupa, what he referred to in the previous paragraph as swarupa dhyana. Uh, so our, our aim should be to cling fast to uninterrupted self-attentiveness. At present, we may not be able to do so doesn't matter. The more we try to cling to self-attentiveness, the closer we will come to holding on to it uninterruptedly. So we just have to persevere in trying, uh, keep on trying. But one often said, the only real sign of progress is perseverance. And then in the next sentence, he says, in the last two sentences, he says, so long as enemies are within the fort, they will continuously come out, uh, continuously, they'll be continuously coming out from it. If one is continuously cutting down all of them, as and when they come, the fort will eventually be captured. Obviously, this is metaphor, he's using a metaphor here. The enemies in the fort are our Vishaya Vasanas. The fort is our own heart, our own real, uh, the, the, uh, the center of our being, our own real nature. So, so long as the Vishaya Vasanas are there, they'll be coming out. But if we, if, we, if we continue cutting them down, that if we cling fast to self-attentiveness, thereby destroying them as and when they come, eventually the, uh, the fort will be captured, we'll take possession of the fort. So um, uh, we will, uh, in answer to your question, uh, why does the eye uh, thought find it so difficult to cling to itself? Because it doesn't have sufficient veragia and doesn't have sufficient veragia because its vishaya vasanas are too strong. Um, so the, the, when Bhagavan talks about vishaya vasanas, these are not things other than ourselves. These are our own inclinations to attend to things other than our own desires and attachments. Of course, we are not those desires. So in that sense, they're other than ourselves, but they, they're not something that exists independent of us. So it's we who have these desires and attachments. So how to wean our mind off these desires and attachments only by this by persistent practice of self-attentiveness um so tarun i hope this adequately answers your question but uh, as i said this you you've touched upon the very heart of bhagavan's teachings which is why i gave a very elaborate answer to your question um so would anyone um like to ask any question before I go on to um, um, uh, answer the next question I received by email. I, I see uh, Gregor, you have your hand up. Did you? Yes. Um, yeah. My question is: so this this phantom ego, which is you know the 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 the, the 
the thought is is it by disidentifying with the thought is that being self attentive as well that is we don't identify with ego ego is what identifies with everything else we are the ego who is identifying with other things ego is not what we actually are but as long as we rise as ego ego is what we experience ourselves to be so ego is that i which is identifying with other things so how to break that identification so long as we cling to other things we remain identified to them the tip that one has given us is don't cling to other things cling to yourself because if you try to cling to yourself if you try to be self-attentive the um the attachment to other things will automatically uh, slip off thank you that is how ego is dissolved so i'll uh, before answering your question sanjay i'll go on to the next question i received by email in fact it's two questions that will probably take us up to the break um this is a question from ash or two questions from ash the first question is if our true state is only one eternal awareness only god exists and when we awaken from a dream on achieving manonasa we don't remember that there was any dream then can it be said that the spiritual help that we get in the form of guru god etc is actually a memory of our true self that is coming to guide us out of the dream and not true reality coming into the illusion to help us thereby giving reality to illusion the course in miracles which is a purely non-dualistic teaching explains it this way and it makes sense as it says that god is not even aware of our dream and the holy spirit who is our helper guiding us out of the dream is the memory of our true self um firstly we though it is said that we have forgotten our real nature what we have forgotten is exactly what we are we never forget that we are so we have never completely forgotten our true self we are always aware of ourselves as i am so bhagwan said atmanyana is not something new to be attained atmanyana is ever present atmanyana simply means self awareness we are always aware of ourselves however though we are aware of ourselves we are not we are aware of ourselves as something other than what we actually are so we need to remove this wrong awareness of ourselves which we can do only by being aware of ourselves as we actually are um so to say it's a memory of our true self is possibly partly true but it's not really a, uh, the best way of expressing it the best way of expressing it it is true god or guru god or guru is nothing but atmasrupa atmasrupa is what alone exists atmasrupa means the real nature of ourselves in the view of that masrupa there is no other so in that sense god or guru is not aware of anything that's happening in this world then how do god and guru help us god and guru god or guru is nothing but our own our own real nature what we actually are we even as ego we have love for ourselves uh because self love is our very nature it's the very nature of atmasrupa to always love itself so god and guru doesn't see us as something other than itself it sees us as itself so let, let, let's say instead of saying god or guru let's just say bhagavan bhagavan doesn't see us as anything other than himself he sees us as himself because he sees us as himself he loves us as himself his grace is that that love he has for us as himself is his grace is is what we experience as grace and it is grace that is manifested in the human form as the human form that we call bhagavan which is not the real form of bhagavan the real form of bhagavan is what is shining in our heart as i am but because we are looking outwards out of the out of that immense love that infinite love that he has for us as himself he his uh, that love uh, is the grace that has appeared out for me in the human form of uh, ramana maharshi our guru bhagavan 
So it is, it is the love, but, uh, but we, as we actually are, have for ourselves as we actually are, but as manifested as Guru. So rather than talking about it in terms of memory of our true self, it is the love that our true self, our real nature, has, that we as our real nature have for ourselves. That is what, is what appears in the form of Guru and Guru's teachings. And what, does guru, what do Guru and Guru's teachings point at? They point it back up to ourself. They say, the happiness you are seeking does not lie outside. It lies within. Turn within and know yourself. So, uh, uh, truly speaking, Bhagavan is not aware of us as anything other than himself. He's not aware of the world. He's not aware of anything. But because he loves us as himself, his love, in the presence of his love, grace functions, or I mean, grace flows automatically. So all the, the divine help and guidance that we get on this path is not, Bhagavan uh, does it without doing it. That is, he doesn't actually do anything. He just is as he is. But by just being as he is, since his nature is love, that love works uh, to draw us back to, to us, to ourselves, to himself, because he is nothing but our real nature. Um, so I hope that adequately answers the first part of your question. The second part of your uh, second question you ask is, um, in fact, it's a series of questions, it's a group of questions. I understand like the dream in sleep, the waking state dream figures are illusory and will disappear with no reality or memory post awakening when we come to know our true self. Or even though this is intellectually understood, it is difficult to comprehend and accept at an emotional level that our loved ones are also dream figures that will vanish away. We who follow the spiritual path with intense desire for Manonasa cannot help but wish our dear ones have the same desire to leave this mire of suffering and would like to help them see a way out. The fear exists of what will happen on awakening from our illusory body that is involved with the family. Who will attend to them when we go? We are told that a realized sage is only seen in an illusory dream by us dreamers, and the sage himself is only awareness and bliss, and unaware of the objective reality, such as body or world. The question then arises, is there only one of us who is dreaming, and once he, she awakes, that is the end? The simple answer to that is yes. In a dream, there is only one dreamer. So long as we are dreaming, we see other people. Because we see ourselves as a person in this dream, that is, we, this ego, see ourselves as a person, that is, we mistake ego to be a person, we mistake every person to be an ego. So it seems to us that all the other people we see in our dream are seeing this same world. Um, but as soon as we wake up, we recognize but all those people were just our own mental projection. Not only all those other people, but even the person we seem to be in a dream was also our mental projection. The dreamer is not the person we seem to be in a dream. The dreamer is ourself as ego. As ego, we project the dream person and the dream world, and we take ourselves to be that dream person and therefore see many other dream people. But it's, the actual dreamer is only ego. Uh, and it's, uh, there is only one ego, and that one ego sees what sees all this. However, when we are looking outside, we are experiencing ourselves as a person. All the other people we see in our dream are just as real as the person we seem to be. So, so long as we experience this person as I, this person seems to be sentient. That is, as I said, Bhagavan refers to the body as Jada Udo, the insentient body. And in Upadesha Undia, in verse, um, um, in verse, uh, verse 20, um, 22 of Upadesha Undia, Bhagavan says, not only this physical body, all the five sheaves, because he says, as he says in verse 5 of Uludhanapu, what he means by Udo, body, is all the five sheaves. So in the, verse 22 of Upadesha Undia, he, he says that all these five sheaves, body, life, mind, intellect, and darkness, um, 
are their old jada and the sat, so they are not I. So um, uh, the dreamer is not is not only not the dream body, but also not the dream mind or anything. The dreamer is that which is the dreamer is the subject. All these other things, all the five sheaths, are objects perceived by us. This physical body is an object perceived by us. Prana is an object perceived by us. The mind, that's all the grosser functions of the mind, are things perceived by us. The intellect and its workings is perceived by us. The, the chittam, the, the will, the consisting of vasanas, they're also perceived by us. We are aware of our inclination to attend to this or to attend to that. So these are all things other than ourselves. We are that which is aware of all these things. So all the five sheaths are jada. So we, even the, the person we seem to be it, is not real. Um, um, in a dream, what is real is only the, the eye that is perceiving it. But the eye that is perceiving it is not wholly real. Because that eye is the chit jada granti. But, but not formed by the entanglement of awareness with, um, with the body. But pure awareness, Satchit, is not aware of any of these things. It's this mixed awareness, I am this body, but is aware of all these things. So that mixed awareness, I am this, but that which is aware of itself as I am this body, that is the dreamer. And that is what is projecting all of this. And there is only one such I. Um, who is that I? The one who is seeing all this. So uh, we can answer that very simply. Um, then you go on to ask, or are there countless split egos dreamers making up one original ego who, is, who are waking at various times and eventually all dreamers will awaken? No, it is not. There is only, in a dream, there is only one dreamer. There are not multiple dreamers. But the dreamer mistakes itself to be a person in the dream and sees multiple people. So it assumes all the multiple people are seeing the same world that it's seeing. And if you ask anyone in your dream, do you see this world? They say, oh, yes, of course I see this world. And when, even when I go to sleep, do you still see the world? Yes, of course we do. If, I'm, if we're awake, we see the world. But when we wake up from that dream, we know all those dreamers are all there um, and all their, uh, their testimony, but the world exists when we don't see it. it, it they were all our mental projection. That's why Bhagavan says, we cannot rely on the testimony of others to, uh, to uh, as, uh, with sufficient evidence the world exists in our absence. Because those others are themselves a part of the world whose existence, when we don't perceive it, is in question. To, uh, to relying on the testimony of others to, uh, as proof of the existence of an external world, an independent world, Bhagavan said that's... Uh, like uh, depending on the um, on the testimony of a of a in, in a court, if someone is accused of a crime, and if they give testimony say, they, saying they didn't do the crime, their testimony doesn't come for anything. They, there needs to be some independent evidence to show that they were not the criminal. We can't depend upon the the accused to bear witness on his or her own behalf. Um, so. And then you go on to, uh, okay, then, um, so there are not multiple dreamers. There's only one dreamer, one ego. Um, uh, then you say, if that is true, then could it be that even our illusory families exist only in our dream? Could they be dreaming their own dreams, but without our knowledge? In a dream, we see many people. We don't suppose that those many people are each having their own dream. At least when we wake up, we don't suppose that. <laughs> when dreaming, we may suppose all sorts of things. Um, but when we wake up, we know they were all just a creation of our own dreaming mind. Um, then you go on to say, I get comfort in Bhagavan quotes such as, your own self-realization is the greatest service you can render to the world. And the only purpose of the present birth is to turn within and realize the self. There is nothing else to do. Can you shed some light onto these two quotes and what Bhagavan meant by them? I.e., how does our awakening from a dream be of service to the world? A clear understanding of Bhagavan's words would provide great encouragement 
to dedicate one's life to nothing else other than turning one's attention within uh, to realize uh, the self. Um, when you're dreaming, you may see so much suffering in your dream. That is, if you look out at the world, you'll see, uh, if you read the newspaper, you'll see there are, um, there are famines, there are, um, there are terrorist attacks, there's all sorts of natural disasters, all sorts of man-made disasters are happening in the world. So there's so many, so many different types of suffering are there. What is the greatest help you can do to end all the suffering you see in a dream? You can go and try and alleviate the suffering by, um, uh, if, a, if there's a famine somewhere, you can try and travel to that place to give food to the starving people, or you can do all sorts of things. But that is not the real help. The greatest help you can do to, all, to end all the suffering you see in the world, in, the, in a dream world, is to wake up from a dream. When you wake up from a dream, all the suffering in that dream world is finished. Likewise, all the suffering we see in this present world will be finished when we wake up to know by knowing our real nature. Um, uh, and regarding the second quote, you say the only useful purpose of the present birth is to turn within and realize the self. There's nothing else to do. Um, it's useful here to refer to verse three of Anma Vide. What Bhagavan says there is. Tane Aridal Indri, Pinne Edu Arihil N. That means without knowing oneself, if one knows whatever else, what? What means here means so what? Or, or what does it matter? What, did the value, what value does such knowledge have? So knowing other things without knowing ourself is worthless, is the implication. And then in the next sentence, he says, if one has known oneself, then Tane Arindadil Pin Ene Uludu Arya. If one has known oneself, then what else exists to know? There is nothing, that is, when we know ourself, there is not, nothing else other than ourself exists. So there's nothing else to know. So in the state of pure, of true self awareness, uh, they, there's nothing other than ourself for us to know. They, we alone exist. But that doesn't mean that we've lost or we've left behind all our family and loved ones. When we, when we know our real nature, we will know that all our loved ones were nothing but our own self. So the, the way to become, become really close to our loved ones, to love them more than we are now capable of loving them, is to know our self. Because then we will see that they are nothing but our self and we will love them as our self, which is a, there's no love greater than the love we have for ourselves as Bhagavan says in the first paragraph of Nana. And then in the next sentence, he says, when one knows, one's, uh, what in, when one knows in oneself that self, which is the light that shines without binna, that means without separation or division or distinction, in, in the separate living beings, within oneself, uh, apma prakasa, the shining or clarity of, uh, or light of oneself, will flash forth. That is, uh, what, it, what we, now when we look outwards, we see as if there are so many living, separate living beings. And what is shining in every one of those living beings, we, it appears to us that there's an eye shining. But actually it's it, that what is shining in each of them is only the one eye. Uh, uh, there's only, there is only one, uh, there's only one eye. And that we find by turning within to know ourselves. And so he says, when, when we know that, but now it seems to be separate in so many, there seem to be so many other egos, so many other jivas. So, so long as we see other people, each one seems to be a jiva. But, so they all seem to be separate. But actually, the, the real light, the, the light of pure awareness, is without any separation. So if we know that one real light, the original light, um, uh, uh, that will shine forth within ourself, as ourself. And then he says, Aro vilasame, aha vinasame, imba vikasame. That means this is Aro vilasame, shining forth of grace. 
Ahavinasa, the annihilation of ego. Uh, Imba Vikasa, the blossoming of happiness. So there's nothing more worthwhile than, um, than uh, seeking to know ourselves. And seeking to know ourselves is the best we can do for ourselves and it's the best we can do for all others. Because those all others exist so long as we seem to exist only so long as we rise as ego. When we, when we know our real nature and see that we alone exist, we will see that all, 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 what seem to be other people are actually nothing but our own self. There is only our own self. As Bhagavan says in the seventh paragraph of Nana, um, he says in the first sentence, um, uh, uh, Yatatmai Uludu Atma Surupa Mondre. What actually exists is only Atma Surupa. Everything else, the world, soul, God, uh, it's all just fabrications, karpanegal, that, that means illusory fabrications, like the illusory silver seen in the mother of pearl. These three appear simultaneously and disappear simultaneously. Surupa, that's one, our own real nature, alone is what appears as the world. He said, Surupa alone is the world. That means Surupa alone is what appears as the world. Surupa alone is I. Surupa alone is God. So what appears as all these three things is nothing but our own real nature. Elam uh, Shiva uh, Swarupamam. Everything is only Shiva Swarupa. That is Swarupa. Uh, the, the, the Shiva Swarupa it means the Swarupa of Shiva, the real nature of Shiva. That is our own, which is nothing but our own real nature, because Swarupa is always one. So we alone exist. It's uh, what we see as all this otherness, all these other people. It's nothing but our own self we're seeing as all these other people. So if we know ourselves as we actually are, there will, there, there will be no world appearing, no others appearing, because we'll have seen what previously appeared as world and all those others was nothing but my own self. Just as what previously appeared to be a snake is now seen to be a rope. A, the snake no longer appears because we see what it actually is, which is a rope. But we're still seeing the same thing. We're not seeing anything different because we, but we are seeing so long as we are seeing the world and God and all this multiplicity we are we are not seeing ourselves as we actually are when we see ourselves as we actually are we will see we alone exist there are no others so what appeared as others is nothing but our own self Sanjay you had a question yes sir may I start sir yes yes sir so in Naniyar and other places, Bhagwan has clearly emphasized uh, that Mita Satvika Ahara, Satvika food in moderate quantity, is the best among all aids to Atma Vichara. Am I clear, sir? Yes. Yes. The more Satvika mind is, the easier it will be to turn within. And the more Satvik food we take, the more sattvika mind, mind becomes. I have seen this with my own experience that if, if I eat a heavy meal, I cannot turn within that easily. The clearer my GI tract, the easier it is for me to turn within. I think consuming mitas, that is moderate food, is extremely important in my case. My question is, what is your experience in this regards? I mean, how much is Mita Satvika Ahara important in your case? Have you experimented with your diet changes, both quality and quantity, and seen their effect on your practice of self-investigation? Um, I, yeah, I, I think we've all had experience. If we overeat, we do feel dull. And um, yes, that obviously a dull mind is not a very, uh, efficient tool for turning within um, and also the quality of the food if we eat um, if we eat non satvic food um, th that obviously affects our mind so we, but we have to remember Bhagavan said this is an aid it is simply there are many people who eat satvic food but they're not inclined to turn their mind within so for those who want to turn their mind within this is eating sattvic food in moderate quantities is an aid. 
Um, but it's not something we have to give too much a thought to, because so long as we're thinking about what we're eating or what we should be eating or whether we should experiment with this or with that, okay, to a certain extent, we, we may experiment, but we've been around in this world for a long time. We've had experience of many different types of food, and we've all, probably all had experience of sometimes eating too much, and we know the effects these have. We don't have to put too much emphasis on these things. Obviously, we need to, <clears throat> as far as sactic is concerned, as I, I think in one of the earlier talks, I, someone had asked about this, um, people have different ideas about what is sactic. According to some people, particularly according to yogis and some orthodox Brahmins, eating garlic or onion is not sattvic. Um, but Bhagavan, I don't think Bhagavan attached much importance to these things because um, he, Bhagavan himself cooked with garlic and onion. And he used to tease his mother because she was very attached to orthodox ways. Oh, no, no, don't touch that. If you touch that food, you, know, you won't be able to get uh, moksha will fly away. He used to tease her because of, to break her attachment to her orthodox beliefs and customs. Um, so, but what Bhagavan did exemplify was a, a following an ahimsa way of life, that is eating only ahimsa food. That is very important. Food, if, if our food is produced in a way that causes harm, that obviously isn't going to be sacred food. So if it's uh, the flesh of another animal or eggs or nowadays even even dairy products um, for most of us the milk that is available commercially nowadays is, is produced uh, uh, on an industrial scale but involves um, the modern dairy industry involves a huge amount of uh, cruelty so it's better to avoid uh, such things to eat only food that is uh, we plant-based food we're on fairly safe ground but it's been produced by him for means um, of course, we can't control everything. Um, <clears throat> the modern methods of farming involve uh, pesticides and things. We, 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 can't, we, we can't change the world. We have to live within the world as it is. But as far as possible, we try to eat simple sattvic food in moderate quantities. We shouldn't give too much. We, uh, that we should, uh, we should, Bhagavan calls this, the sattvic ahara niyama. Niyama means it's a, it's, a, it's a restriction. So we should follow that restriction without giving too much importance to it. We, I mean, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't dwell upon it because our, our attention should be turning within. Not We shouldn't be making research on food. But we can endlessly make research on food and find that um, maybe garlic and onion does have some effect, but the effect it has on the mind is negligible. It may be important if you're following a path of yoga or some form of some yoga practices, but in Bhagavan's path, it's not so important. What's important in Bhagavan's path is trying as much as possible to turn our attention within. So that is what we should be focusing on and not uh, giving too much in, not giving too much thought or attention to food. Just the minimum to ensure that we abide by this Mitta Sattvika Hara Niyama. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, so I'll now answer the next uh, question that I was asked, um, which is asked by Kartik. Um, it, it's again, it's uh, uh, two sets of questions. The first one is, whenever I see or hear about the demise of a mortal body and departure of a soul, I inevitably introspect on my life. I feel my mind is unable to constantly abide in the self and still wandering, even after knowing that whatever I desire is ultimately for this body and mind, which is not worth striving for, knowing its impermanent nature. Sometimes I feel an urge to devote my every minute of waking life to attending to the self, but somehow a fear of making an, an earning to support my life puts me on activities and then I get caught up in the play of mind where other desires find its way to enter the mind. How can one develop unwavering love to attend to uh, the self? Um, <clears throat> regarding uh, 
taking care of our body. According to Bhagavan, we don't have to we don't have to give much attention to that because what this body is to experience has all is already determined by prarabdha. So if we sh if it's our destiny, if it's the destiny of this body to have a certain job and to earn in a certain way, and maybe sometimes to be made redundant and then to get another job, all these things happen according to destiny. So we should we we should we don't have to give much attention to these things. What is most important is that we try to attend to ourselves. Because when we attend to ourselves, we we cannot certain actions of body, speech, and mind are required in order for us to experience our prarabdha. For example, if it's our prarabdha to, to have a certain type of job, we have to do whatever activities are necessary to qualify for that job and then to carry out that job. So those activities will be made to do according to prarabdha. If we attend to our, if we cling firmly to ourselves, the actions that we are avoiding doing is the actions driven by our vasanas, driven by our will. That is agamya. So the more we uh, are self-attentive, the more we will refrain from rising to do actions driven by our vasanas, and uh, <coughs> thereby we will, be we will be refraining from doing agamya. But the actions that are necessary in order for our prarabdha to unfold, those actions will go on. So. The truth is, we don't need to attend to anything else. As Bhagavan says in um, the 13th paragraph of, uh, of Nana, what is that, that if we surrender ourselves, nothing else in that, no other thoughts are necessary. He begins by uh, defining what is true surrender. What, is, what does it mean to be giving oneself to God? In the main clause of this sentence, I'll read the main clause first and then the, the subsidiary clause. The main clause is Admanishta Paranai Iripade Tane Isinaku Alipadam. That means being as Admanishta Paran is giving oneself to God. What is Atmanishta Paran? Atmanishta means uh, means being fixed in a, as oneself, as one's real nature, that implies. So if we if we remain as one who is completely fixed in and as our real nature, that is giving ourselves to God. How to remain uh, as Abhmanishta Paran? That he explains in the subsidiary clause, which is actually the first clause of the sentence. Anma chintane tabira, vera chintane kalamba vataku satram idam kodamo. That means without giving the slightest room to the rising of any thought, other than Atma Chintana. Atma Chintana literally means thought of oneself, but in effect it means self-attentiveness. So how to, how to give no room to the rising of any other thought? If we cling firmly to Atma Chintana, that is the self-attentiveness, the more we cling to self-attentiveness, the less we'll be giving room for the rising of any other thought. If we attend only to ourselves, There'll be no one to attend to any other thoughts, so thoughts can't arise without our attending to them. So by attend, by clinging firmly to Atma Chintana, to self-attentiveness, we are thereby giving not the slightest room to the rising of any other thought, and we are thereby remaining as Atmanishta Param, fixed in as, as ourself, and that is giving ourself to God. So that is true surrender. So thinking about other things, is not so to the extent that we're thinking about other things to that extent we are not surrendering ourselves to god but there are so many other important things to think about we may think i've got my job to do i've got this and that bhagavan says, says in the next three sentences bhagavan's explaining why we need not think about anything else in the next sentence he says um even though one places whatever amount of burden upon god that the entire amount he will bear so if we leave God even the, the task of thinking for us, he will bear that burden. He will do the thinking, whatever thinking is necessary for us. So let the mind go on doing whatever it is to do, driven by him. Because as he said in the note to his mother, Avarava prarabdha prakarum adhikanavan angan girindu artavipan. According to the prarabdha of each person, he who is for that, that means God, will make them act 
will, will literally means will make them being there there being in the heart of each room will make them dance Atubipan means make them dance. So our body, speech, and mind, whatever actions our body, speech, and mind have to do according to Prarabdha, God will make them do those actions. So we can leave even the burden of thinking, or even the burden of earning a livelihood, leave that whole burden to God. He will bear all of it. That's a great assurance what uh, Bhagavan gives us there. Then in the next sentence, he says, um, Sakala Kari and uh, that is, since um, since uh, <coughs> since um, since one Parameshwara Shakti, Parameshwara Shakti, Parameshwara means Ishwara is, it means God or the, ru, ru, the ruling power. So Parameshwara Shakti means the supreme ruling power or the power of God is driving all karyas. Karyas means everything that is meant to happen, everything that needs to happen, everything that is destined to happen is being driven by God. So knowing that he is driving all those karyas, namam adaku adangi rama, instead of... Um, we ourselves surrender, uh, yielding ourselves to that, instead of surrendering ourselves to him, um, um, uh, why to be always thinking, it's necessary to do this, it's necessary to do that. Um, so he, since God is making everything happen as it's meant to happen, we don't even have to think about what we should do or what we shouldn't do. What we should do, he will make us do. That is what our body, speech, and mind should do. He will drive them to do. It's no concern of ours. We, we should be just surrendering ourselves entirely to him. By How do we surrender ourselves entirely to him? He explained that in this first sentence, giving not even the slightest room to rising of any thought other than apachintana, other than self-attentiveness. So by clinging to self-attentiveness, we are surrendering ourselves to God and leaving him free to drive our body, speech, and mind according to, uh, according to their destiny. And then in the final sentence, he gives a beautiful analogy. Though we know that the train is be kept bearing all the burdens, why should we who go traveling in it, instead of remaining happily leaving our small luggage placed on the train, suffer bearing it, our luggage, on our head? So when we're traveling on a train, whether we carry the luggage on our head or we put it aside on the seat or put it up on the luggage rack, the train is carrying it anyway. So by carrying it on our own head, we are suffering unnecessarily. Uh, what does this analogy mean? By thinking that we have to do this or we have to do that, thinking that, uh, that uh, anything depends on any, any of the happenings in the world, any of the carriers in the world depend on us, is carrying our luggage on our head. So Bhagavan says, don't think, you need not think about anything whatsoever. Cling only to Atmachintana, to self-attentiveness. That's all that is required. God will take care of everything else. So that's what Bhagavan says in this sentence is a very great assurance. And he says, what is the result of leaving the entire burden to God? He, 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 he gives some clues there. He says, um, uh, instead of nam namudeya siriya muteyum muteyum adil potu vittu sukumai rama sukumai means happily. So instead of remaining happily, leaving our small luggage aside, if we carry our luggage on our head, it's we suffer and it's uncomfortable, it's painful. But if we put it aside, we we are carefree, we're happy. Um, and then he contrasts that with carrying it on our head. Ade namudu talayil tangi kondu ein kashtapadavendum. Why to suffer bearing it on our head? So we have a choice. We can either leave everything to Bhagavan and thereby be happy, or we can carry the burden on our head and suffer. So if we are suffering in any way, that shows we are still carrying our burden on our head. Leave it to Bhagavan. Stop thinking of anything else. Think only of yourself. Attend only to yourself. That's what Bhagavan says here. 
We may not be able to do so, but that is our aim. We should try to more and more um, attend to ourselves. So you asked, how can one develop unwavering love to attend to, uh, to oneself? That I, I, earlier I read what Bhagavan has said in the 10th and 11th paragraph. The more and more we cling to self-attentiveness, the more the weaker our Vishaya Vasanas become. And as our Vishaya Vasanas become weak, our Vairagya become strong. And what is the other side of Vairagya? Bhakti. Bhakti and Vairagya are inseparable. To the extent that we love, Bhakti means we love to be as we actually are. So to the extent we love to be as we actually are, to that extent we are free of desires for other things. To the extent our desires for other things are strong, we don't, we don't have, have yet have sufficient love to attend to ourselves. So when he talks there about bhakti, when he talks, sorry, when he talks in that 11th paragraph about Vairagya, bhakti is implied there. That is by attending to ourselves more and more, the love to attend to ourselves will, will increase. That is the only way. We, ca we cannot, uh, we, we, by attending to anything other than ourselves, we cannot develop the love to attend to ourselves. To develop the love to attend to ourselves, we have to practice attending to ourselves. Of course, by reading Bhagavan's teachings, thinking about his teaching, these all help us, encourage us to turn within and thereby to increase our, our love to attend to it. So it is useful to think about Bhagavan's teachings and uh, dwell on them. But the Bhagavan's teachings are useful only to the extent that we actually put them into practice, only to the extent that we actually try to turn within. And the more we try to turn within, the more that love to turn within will increase. So how, how to learn to ride a bicycle? By getting on a bicycle and learning to ride. How to learn how to love being self-attentive? By trying to be self-attentive. That's the simple answer. The more we try, the more we'll develop that love. Because, why? Because every time we try to cling to ourselves, we are at least to a little extent taking the burden off our head, taking our little luggage off our head. And we experience the happiness resulting therefrom. So the more we attend to ourselves, the more we are relieved from the burden of thinking about anything else. And the more we do this, the more we find actually thinking about anything else is unnecessary. Why do we think about other things? Because of our Vishaya Vasanas. Why should we allow our, why should we allow our Vishaya Vasanas to drive us to think about other things? Though the Vishaya Vasanas may urge us to think about other things, it's up to us. Do we give in to our inclinations or do we not give in to our inclinations? We, we all fail, um, face times in life where there are temptations. We are inclined to eat a little more food than, than we know is good for us, or we're inclined to do this or that, we always have a choice. We can either, vasanas means inclinations. We can either follow our inclinations or we can refrain from following them. The best way to refrain from following our inclinations is by clinging to self-attentiveness. By clinging to self-attentiveness, we are thereby developing satvasana, the inclination just to be. That is, the that is what is otherwise called the love to attend to oneself, the love to be as oneself. So that's your first question, um, uh, Kartik. The second question, um, I feel loving others, helping others are very noble. However, I feel all these are only happening in the dream we call as life and thereby giving a uh, reality to it. I realize that waking up from the dream should be given a high priority than spending time on, uh, than spending time on how to properly act in the dream. I also feel but I should not have reached this stage of my life without such a noble act of caring and support from others. And I feel gratitude for it. So I also see the need for helping a fellow, a fellow people to evolve together in the dream of life. Is it wise to engage in the dream after intellectually comprehending that life is a dreamlike state? If so, to what extent one has to engage in this world? How can I balance life and attending to myself? Well, according to what Bhagavan says in this 13th paragraph, we don't have to attend to the world at all. All we have to attend to is ourselves. Everything else will be taken care of by God. So we don't actually have to attend to anything else. However, we are still um, 
we still don't have so much vairagya. We still don't have so much love to attend to ourselves. So our mind does still come out. We do still see the world. So how we should act in the world, so long as we are seeing the world, how we should act in the world, Bhagavan has taught us in the final two paragraphs of Nana. Um, in the 19th paragraph, he says, Nala manam endrum, keta manam endrum, irendu manangal ille. Uh, there are not two minds, namely a good mind and a bad mind. Um, manam andre, mind is only one. Vasana, vasana galeye, va, sorry, vasana, vasana, vasana gal, vasana galeye, uh, subam endrum, a subam endrum, irenda vidam. Only vasanas are of two kinds, namely subha and asubha. Subha means what's agreeable, virtuous, good. Asubha means what's disagreeable, um, wicked or harmful. When the mind is under the way of sway of subha vasanas, it is said to be a good mind. And when it is under the sway of asubha vasanas, a bad mind. However bad other people may appear to be, disliking them is not proper. That is, we see all sorts of bad people, people who appear to us to be bad. Why are they bad? Because they're under the sway of their subhavasanas. So, so we should not dislike them. If we dislike them, we are then under the sway of our vishaya subhavasanas. Because it's only a subhavasanas that rise in the form of likes and dislikes. So Bhagavan goes on to say, um, uh, what, what was it? Um, um, uh, <coughs> Um, virupu verupu irendum verukatak kana. Likes and dislikes are both to be disliked, both fit to be disliked. Prapanja vishayan galil adikamai manate vida kodadu. It is not appropriate to let one's mind dwell excessively on worldly matters. This is a very important sentence because when we see what's happening in the world, all the injustices, all the politics that's going on, the corruption, the injustices, the suffering that people have to go on. It's easy to let our mind dwell on the world, but Bhagavan advises us not to allow our mind to dwell excessively on other things. The more we turn our attention within, the more we're leaving the entire burden of the world on God. If we're attending to the world and lamenting about all the injustices and all the uh, the pain, seeing all the sufferings and everything, we are carrying the burden of the world on our head. Why should we do that? Leave it to God. Let him take care of it all. So Bhagavan advises not to dwell, allow our mind to dwell excessively on worldly matters. And then he says, um, um, galil kudadu. That means to the extent possible, it's not appropriate to intrude in others' affairs. In other words, we, as far as possible, we should mind our own business. We shouldn't interfere in other people's affairs, to the extent possible. There are times when our involvement in certain worldly activities, it, it is the circumstances sometimes require. But even that, we should leave that burden to Bhagavan. Bhagavan, you guide me how I should uh, behave in that, that situation. I've been, myself, I've been in an awkward situation recently. Uh, people have been commenting on my blogs and very, very unpleasant comments people have been making, vitriolic comments uh, against other people and everything. So I, as the owner of the blog, obviously I have a responsibility to, um, but I find it very difficult to sit in judgment and decide which comments to allow, which comments to not allow. So of late, for, because I was busy with other work, I just I stopped moderating comments. I allowed people to post whatever they like. And things got out of hand. And even after I wrote a long article explaining how it's completely against Bhagavan's teachings to write in such a way, people went on writing in such a way. So finally, I had to just stop the comments, at least for the time being. Um, so sometimes we are put in situations where we do have to intrude. I had to intrude because it's... Uh, as the owner of the blog, I have a certain responsibility to other people who want to come and read about Bhagavan's teachings and don't want to read abuse that people are writing about each other. So um, 
so sometimes it, it, we, we are forced into a situation where we have to intrude, but as far as possible, it's not appropriate to intrude in others' affairs. And then he says, All that one gives to others, one is giving only to oneself. If this truth is known, who will remain without giving? When Bhagavan says, who will remain without giving? Obviously, he's referring here to the good things we do to others. It equally applies to the bad things. If you do bad to someone else, you're give, it's, the one you're really doing bad to is yourself. Because by giving to others, you are, you are separating yourself from your, from the, your more um, selfish vasanas. By, by giving good things to others. By doing harmful to others, you're succumbing to your uh, supervasanas. So in other case, it's, if we do good to others, we're doing good to ourselves. If we do bad to others, we're doing bad to ourselves. So knowing this, we should do only what is good. So when we look outwards, we see the world. Sometimes if we see a hungry person, we give them food. If we, if we act in an appropriate way according to the circumstances. But as Bhagavan says, uh, we sh it's not appropriate to allow our mind to dwell excessively on worldly matters. Mm -hmm. Our main focus should be trying to turn within more and more and more and more and uh, remaining unconcerned about the world because the world has never been perfect. There have always been injustices in the world. They've always been, and however much people have tried to, ref good people have tried to reform the world, it, it's still problems remain. You solve one problem, another problem arises. So the nature of the world is problems. So long as there are so many people in this world with so many different types of vasanas, there's going to be clashes and all sorts of problems are going to be there. We can't solve these problems. The, as Bhagavan says in uh, Guru Vachika Kauvai, unless one acts on the principle, but what needs to be reformed is only one's own mind, our mind will become more and more impure by seeing the, the faults of others. Rather than seeing the faults of others, let's turn within and try to know what we ourselves actually are, and thereby get rid of all our own faults. Then in the final paragraph, Bhagavan says, Tan erandal sakalumum erum. If oneself appears or oneself arises, everything rises. That means if we rise as ego, everything else rises. The same that he said in verse 26 of Uludhanapi, but I quoted earlier. Hande yundayan anetum undahum. Hande yundrel indru anetum. If ego comes into existence, everything comes into existence. If ego doesn't exist, everything doesn't exist. So he says more or less the same thing here. Tan erandal sakalomum um erum. If oneself uh, uh, rises, everything rises. Tan uh, adanginal Sakalomum uh, 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 adangum. If oneself subsides, everything subsides. Subside means ceases, uh, subsides and ceases to exist, it implies. Then in the next sentence, a very, very important sentence, he says, Evelo kevlo tandu nadikiromo, avalo kavlo nanmayundu. That literally means, to whatever extent sinking low we behave, to that extent there is goodness. Sinking low, tandu, that means subsiding or being humble. So the more, more uh, subsidingly or humbly we behave in this world, uh, but to that extent, it's good. So we, Bhagavan doesn't ask us to do good things in the world. He just says subside, subside, subside. The more we subside, if, we, if, if ego is subsided, whatever actions our body, speech and mind do will automatically be good actions. But if we allow ego to rise, then we are interfering and then our, the, the, the act, we are acting under the sway of our vasanas and then whatever we do will be less than perfect. So we should surrender the body and mind completely to God. Let him drive them according to his will. And then in the final sentence he says, <clears throat> Manate, uh, man, um, manate adaki kondirundal Enge uh, irandalam irakalam. If one is continuously restraining or curbing the mind, wherever one may be, one may be. 
curbing the mind means not allowing the attention to come outwards, not allowing the mind to be driven under the sway of its vasanas. So just to turn our attention within, uh, the more we turn our attention within, the less we will be affected by whatever circumstances we may be in. Our outward circumstances may be, seem, be seemingly favorable or seemingly unfavorable. So long as our attention is turning within, we don't have to worry about the external circumstances. Enge uh, Yerandalam Irakalam means wherever one may be, one can be. It can also mean wherever one, one can, may be, let one be. Right? Just be, Irakalam. So that's the essence of Bhagavan teachings. We have to subside more and more by turning within to attend to I. Um, uh, so I hope this answers your question. How can I balance life and uh, attending to a self? The only way to balance life is by attending to the self. By more we are, we are self-attentive, the more we are leaving everything in, in the hands of God, and the more he will take care of everything much better than we can take care of it all. So let us leave it. Even if we don't leave it to him, he's still taking care of it. We're just interfering and unnecessarily getting ourselves into trouble, with suffering, carrying our luggage on our head. Let's leave aside the luggage and leave everything, all cares to him. We want to follow Bhagavan's path, we have to be happy. And to be happy, we have to turn within and subside. A sign of being a true follower of Bhagavan is being happy. But we cannot be happy so long as we allow our mind to come outward. So to the extent we allow our mind to come outward, we are thereby carrying our luggage on our head and suffering. So I hope that adequately answers your question, Karthik. Um, Oh, Sanjay and Gregor both have your hands up. Uh, have you raised your hands again or just not put your hands down? Sanjay? Raise it again. We have raised it again. I have raised it again. Okay. Yes, sir. Can I ask my question? Yes, yes. Yes. So now Bhagwan talks about Vishaya Vasanas in paragraph 10 and 11 of Naniyar. Yes. He says that our Vishaya Vasanas will all be destroyed when Sarupa Dhyana gains momentum. He also says that as long as Vishay Vasanas exist, self-investigation is necessary. Now, we are fighting against our Vishay Vasanas. Yes. However, as, as far as I know, Bhagwan does not talk about Vishay Vasanas in Ulladi Narmadu or in any of his other works. Yes. Or has he talked about it? If he has talked about these, what has he said about Vishay Vasanas at, at, uh, at his different works? Means, uh, only these two paragraphs we find about Vishaya Vasanas, but not in Ulladu Narpadu and in other works. But this is the main thing we are fighting against. Yes. So yes, has, yes. He, has he referred to this in other places? Bhagavan had written um, Nana before writing Ulladu Narpadu and, um, and Upadesha India. Each of those works he wrote in a particular context. He didn't, uh, any ideas in, in Nana are repeated in one way or another in Uludu Napadu and uh, Upadesh Undia. Upadesh Undia was written in a particular context. It is about, um, it, it's about spiritual practice, but he doesn't go into it at the level of, de though he talks about self-investigation there, he doesn't go into it at the same level of detail that he goes into in Nana, because he'd already done, the, he'd already covered that thoroughly in Nana. Um, in Uludu Napadu, he also talks a lot about self-investigation, but in a, uh, not so much getting down to the nitty-gritty of the practical challenges of how to deal with these Vishaya Vasanas. So in this way, these three texts are complementary to each other. In Arunachastuta Panchakam is all about love. And love is the, is the way to overcome our Vishaya Vasanas. So though he, in Arunachal Stuta Panchakam, he hasn't explicitly talked about Vishaya Vasanas, he's talked about the opposite of Vishaya Vasanas, which is Bhakti. He's taught us the path of true love, who Bhakti, which is nothing but the path of self-investigation. But he's explained it in the language of Bhakti, in Arunachal Stuta Panchakam, in the language of philosophy, in all of the Napa, Nana, etc. But all these works are complementary to each other. We cannot understand Bhagavan's teachings completely without, under, without taking all these works together. That is, 
uh, in, in a certain sense, Nana is the most important of all of them because he gives the real practical nitty gritty of how to put it into practice. But it's complemented by a, a lot of the uh, principles underlying Uludunapdu are clearly laid out in Uludunapdu. And in Upadesh Undi, he relates this practice to other practices and shows how those other practices can also be useful, in, but ultimately they all have to lead to this practice. And Arunachas Stuti Panchakam, it's all about love. And love, as Bhagavan said, Bhakti is the mother of jnana. Love is the key. So we, by, uh, by reading, just reading um, uh, Nana, Uludunapdu, Upadesh Undiya, that's, that's the, the core and essence of it, but it's still not complete without Aranatya Stuti Panchakam. Because Aranatya Stuti Panchakam is the, is the key to the whole, to understanding the whole thing. We must, without love, we cannot practice this. Because this is, this path Bhagavan has taught us is not only the path of self-investigation, it is the path of surrender. Because we cannot, we can investigate ourselves only to the extent we surrender ourselves. Because only to the extent we let go of other things, we can cling to ourselves. So surrender is, 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 is inseparable from self-investigation. And how, why should we surrender ourselves? Why would we surrender ourselves? You, you'll be willing to surrender yourself only if it's for love, something greater than yourself. That's your little self, your ego. So the love is the key to surrender. And surrender is the key to vicharan. So these are all inseparable. So he doesn't repeat himself, say the same thing. Well, I mean, it's, there are certain ideas that occur in all these three, all these works, in Stuti Panchakam, in Nuladunapu, in Nanya, Upadeshundya, but they're expressed in different ways, different aspects of the, the teachings he gives. So does that adequately answer that question? Yes, sir, more than adequately, just a complimentary small question. How do you contain so much of love for Bhagwan within you? How do you contain it? It's just bursting out of you. I don't ask me, ask Bhagavan. And there's not so much love for Bhagavan in me, unfortunately. I still have love for Bhagavan. So long as there's an ego, the love for Bhagavan is uh, lacking. Because ego is taking up too much space. It's just, it's just coming out of you. If we want to have true love for Bhagavan, this ego has to subside. So my love is no better than anyone else's love. I just happen to talk a lot. I'm a, I'm a, a chatterbox, that's all. I'm no better than anyone else. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thank um, you very much. Uh, the next question I was asked by email, I'll, I'll answer this and then I'll ask, answer what, uh, I think the next question is by uh, Gregor. I'll answer that after answering this. Um, uh, Jose has written, um, he refers to a particular video, I, I'm not sure which video it is, and says, in this video you have explained that perception of objects is ignorance, but pure perception is knowledge. Um, I, I think there's a slight uh, translation problem here. I don't think uh, perception is quite the appropriate word here. I think it is, I, I would have said awareness of objects is ignorance, Whereas pure awareness is knowledge, is true knowledge. Um, and he says, I see two possible ways of interpreting this. Simply no perception of anything, the experience of deep sleep is one, one possibility. Or two, perceptions of things, but predicated on the absolute understanding that this is all happening within ourself, ourselves as mind. Could you please guide us into which interpretation is closer to the message you're referring to? According to Bhagavan, what knows objects, what is aware of objects is the subject, that is ego. When we, only when we rise as ego, are we aware of things other than ourselves. So long as we're aware of things other than ourselves, this is not pure awareness. Pure awareness is awareness that is aware of nothing other than itself. That is awareness that is devoid of content, devoid of objects of awareness. That is our real nature. Um, so, so long as we rise as ego, we're aware of phenomena, of objects. When we turn our attention back within, and when we know ourselves as we actually are, we will know ourselves as pure awareness, and therefore we will not be aware of anything other than ourselves. Uh, 
we we will not actually be uh, aware of anything. Okay, let me put this correctly. What we are aware of remains the same. But even now, what we are aware of is only ourselves. But now we're aware of ourselves as all these objects of the world. When we are aware of ourselves as we actually are, we'll be aware of ourselves alone. So it, when, when you look at the snake carefully and see that it's only a rope, you're still seeing the same thing, but you're no longer seeing it as a snake, you're seeing it only as a rope, which is what it actually is. Likewise, when we, so long as we are seeing this world, what are we seeing as this world? We're seeing ourselves as this world. When we see ourselves as we actually are, we will no longer see ourselves as the world, we'll see only ourselves. But we alone know what actually exists. As Bhagavan says in, um, in, uh, um, um, in, in the um, seventh first sentence of the seventh paragraph, which I read earlier, seventh paragraph of Nana, um, what actually exists is only Atmasrupa, the real nature of oneself. When we know the real nature of ourself, as he says in, um, in, uh, in um, Upadesha Undia, in uh, verse, um, verse uh, 28 of Upadesha Undia, uh, if, one, uh, if one knows what the nature of oneself is, then beginningless, endless, unbroken Satchidananda. That is, that, what that implies is, if we know what we actually are, what remains then, what shines then, is only anadi, beginningless, uh, uh, ananta, endless, limitless, infinite, akanda, unbroken, undivided, unfragmented, satchidananda, being, awareness, happiness. So when we know ourselves, we'll know nothing other than ourselves. When we know ourselves as we actually are, we know nothing other than that. Well, so long as we know other things, we are not knowing ourselves as we actually are. In um, Bhagavan has made this very clear in verse 13 of um, Uludunapadu. He begins by saying, Jnana mam tane me. One self who is awareness, Jnana, alone is real. Nana vam Jnanam agnana mam. Awareness that is manifold is ignorance. That is awareness of many things, that is ignorance. And then he says, even that ignorance, which is unreal, does not exist except as oneself who is awareness. That is what we are, all this multiplicity that we are seeing is nothing other than ourself. So even the uh, ignorance of seeing many things is nothing other than ourself. And he gives a simple analogy there. All the many ornaments are unreal say, do they exist except as gold, which is real? So in gold ornaments, what is real is the substance, the gold. But many forms are not real because you can, today it may appear as a ring, tomorrow it may appear as a gold coin or as a earring or something else. You could, the, the forms change, the substance remains the same. So the substance is pure awareness. Nyanamam tane me. One self who is awareness alone is real. That is the substance. Uh, that one compares there to gold. The awareness of many things, that is just like the, the, for, the forms in which the gold is formed. The forms are unreal. So even that ignorance of seeing many things, that is unreal. It doesn't exist as other than the pure awareness which alone is, is real. So what is real is only ourselves. So that is what we should cling to. And if we cling to that, as he says in the previous verse, um, he, he explains what is, what is completely devoid of knowledge and ignorance alone is knowledge. That is, um, knowledge and ignorance mean knowledge and ignorance of other things. So we, the, the pure awareness is, a, is devoid of, of both awareness and ignorance about other things. That alone is real knowledge. That which knows, implying that which knows anything other than itself, namely ego, is not real awareness. And then he says, since uh, our real nature shines without another for knowing or for causing to know, uh, oneself alone is arivu, is, is pure awareness. One is not a void. So the awareness of, of, of many things is ignorance. To, when we know ourselves as we actually are, we will cease being aware of many things, we'll be aware of ourselves alone. 
I hope that adequately answers your question, Jose. So, um, in terms of the way you worded your question, uh, the uh, two possible ways to interpret this. The first way of interpreting it is closer. Simply no perception of anything. No, I mean, no awareness of anything other than ourselves. This is the aware experience of deep sleep. In deep sleep, we're aware of ourselves, but not aware of anything else. However, the problem with deep sleep, there's no problem in deep sleep. In sleep, we have no complaints. But we, now we have, in waking and dream, we seem to have come out of sleep. So sleep seems to us to be a temporary state. When we know our real nature, we will know that we were eternally asleep. Asleep means in the state of pure awareness, where we weren't aware of anything other than ourselves. So sleep appears defective only from the perspective of ego in waking and dream. Ego doesn't exist in sleep, but it exists in waking and dream. And it sees sleep as a limited state, a state limited between periods of waking and dream. Whereas when we know our real nature, we will know that what shines in sleep is what is our real nature. Because in sleep, there's no awareness of multiplicity, no nana vamyanam, so there is no ignorance. There is only pure awareness, which is our real nature. Nyanam uh, tane me. When self who is awareness alone is real. So I hope that answers your question, Jose. Um, now the next question, Gregor, you had another question you wanted to ask? Yeah, um, my question was about um, what Bhagavan says about free will and destiny. And so we have, we have free will to return our attention within ourselves, but we don't have any free will to change our destiny. Well, the term free will is a, is a term which there's a lot of confusion about the term free will because people, people are not precise in what they mean. There are three types of freedom we can talk about. There's freedom of will, freedom of action, and freedom of achievement. We are free to want whatever we want and to not want whatever we don't want. No one can make you want anything that you don't want. So our will as such is absolutely free. But, but, but why our will doesn't seem to be fully free is that we want too many things. Uh, we have many vasanas and they're in conflict with each other. We want to turn within and we also want to enjoy the world. These two are going in opposite direction. So the, the, the only limitation on our will is, a, is not an external limitation. Nothing outside us can make us want what we don't want, but our, our desires are in conflict with one another. So now we need to, what we need to rectify is our will by giving up our desire for all other things and grow, developing our love to know ourselves. So the work that we do is the work in our will. I think sadhana is all about our will. So in that sense, our will is completely free. Action, we are free, within certain limits, we are free to act. According to, um, uh, according to, uh, we, we could, that, that is just as our vasanas are driving our mind, they also, the mind, the mind is what drives the body and uh, speech to act. So the vasanas are, the same vasanas, but, but if the mind is under the sway of vasanas, the body and speech will also be under the sway of those vasanas. So we're able to act within certain limits. So we've got limited freedom of action. As far as achievement is concerned, I'm talking now about achievement of uh, worldly things, we have absolutely no freedom because what, is, what we are destined to experience, we will experience. We cannot avoid experiencing what we're destined to experience. And in order to experience what we're destined to experience, certain actions of body, speech, and mind are required. Those actions will be made to, the body, speech, and mind will be driven to do by God, as Bhagavan says in the first sentence of his note to his mother. According to the prarabdha of each person, he who is for that, that means God, or Guru, or Bhagavan, will make them, will make them dance. Being, in the heart, being there, there, being in the heart of each of them, will make them dance. Then in the next sentence he says, Endrum naduvadadu, enmuyachikanum naduvadu. That means, what, what is, 
not to, what is not to happen, what, what is not going to happen, is not going to happen, however much effort you make. Narapadu en tadeseinum niladu. What is to happen will not stop however much obstruction you make. We free to, we treat, free to try to change Pararabdha, we're free to try to obstruct Pararabdha, but we are not free to actually do so. It will happen as it is destined to happen. Iduve Tindam Bhagavan said, this is certain. Ahalin Monamayirake Nandru. Therefore, being silent is good. Being silent means what? Not rising as ego. Only when we rise as ego, then we come under the sway of our bhasanas and we engage in all this agamya. Some people misunderstand, but some people who recorded some of Bhagavan's, what Bhagavan said, they didn't understand the nuances in what Bhagavan taught. So it is wrongly recorded in some books as if it, it, it seems to, as if Bhagavan implied, but everything is according to destiny. Everything is predestined. If everything was predestined, then what room would there be to do any agamya? There, there are three types of, of, of karma. Karma begins with agamya. Agamya is the actions that we do by our will. The fruit of those actions gets stored in sanchitta. Sanchita means the store of the fruits. Those fruits are selected by God for us to experience as prarabdha. If we, had, if we weren't able to act according to our will, how could we do sanchita? I mean, sorry, how could we do agamya? Then how would there be any fruits for us to experience as prarabdha? So we do have the ability to do agamya. We shouldn't do agamya, but we have the ability to do, we are free to do. But what is dangerous is Bhagavan has made it very clear in the second verse of Upadesha India. Um, that is, there are two types of um, results of actions. There's the fruit and the seeds. The fruit is what we experience as prarabdha. So um, the, when you do an, an, an action, a, a, a gamya action, that has a certain uh, fruit. That gets stored in Sanchitta. Because we do more agamya in every lifetime when we, when we consume prarabdha, the sanchitta is always growing in size. So God has a, a, a vast store of past actions, that we, uh, the fruits of past actions that we haven't yet experienced. When we experience the fruit of a past action as prarabdha, that fruit, when, you eat a, when you eat an apple or a mango, that mango no longer exists. So Bhagavan says in this second verse, the fruit of action having perished. So when we experience the, the fruit of an action, that action has thereby ceased, that fruit has thereby ceased to exist. But as seed, it causes to fall in the ocean of action. That is, though the fruit is consumed, the seed remains. The seeds of the vasanas. When we do actions, we are, we are cultivating and strengthening our vasanas. Those vasanas are what cause us to fall in the ocean of action. So because of the vasanas, it, uh, in, in Tamil he says, it, uh, um, uh, it, it makes us, it causes us to fall in the ocean of action. In Sanskrit he explains it, he puts it a bit more graphically. He says, Kriti Mahodado, the great action of, of, the great ocean of action, this vast ocean of action. But in Sanskrit, unfortunately, he doesn't translate the key word, which is vittu, uh, uh, the seed. Uh, that, that, because he wrote in a slightly smaller meter in Sanskrit, and it was it poetry by limitation. But the key to this verse is that it's seeds that cause us to fall in the ocean of action. What are those seeds? It's the vasanas. So even though we experience the fruit of an action, the seed still remains. So the problem we face, prarabdha is ordained by, is, is allotted to us by, Bhagavan for our own good. So we don't have to be concerned about prarabdha. Whatever prarabdha we have to experience, however difficult it may seem to be, it is actually for our good. So we need not try to change our prarabdha. We should not try to change our prarabdha. The problem we face is these seeds. The seeds are what we have to get rid of. The seeds are our vishaya vasanas. And for every vishaya vasana, there's a corresponding karma vasana. If, 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 I, if you have a vishaya vasana, you have a liking to eat chocolate, 
that will give you a karma vasana to go and take the chocolate. And so the, the, the heart of every karma vasana is a vishaya vasana. So it's the vishaya vasanas of a problem. But for whom are these vishaya vasanas? Whose vishaya vasanas are they? Our real nature doesn't have any vishaya vasana. It's only when we rise as ego in sleep, where are our vishaya vasanas? <laughs> They're nowhere to be seen. When we rise as ego, we have vishaya vasana. So the root of the vishaya vasana is e ego. That's why Bhagavan says we need to get rid of this ego. But in order to get rid of the ego, we need to considerably weaken our vishaya vasanas because so long as the vishaya vasanas are strong, they're taking our attention outwards. So the ego is like the general and the vishaya vasanas are like his army. So we have to, we have to, uh, decimate his uh, army to a great extent before we can get hold of the general. Bhagavan gave that analogy of the enemy coming out of a fort. We have to cut them down as and when they come. Then only we can get into a fort and catch that general and um, punish him appropriately. How to, punish, how to punish him? He's in nothing but a false awareness of ourselves. So we need to, if we want to execute this ego, we need to know ourselves as we actually are. That's a punishment. So the end of ego is the end of all karma. Yes, yes. Bowen says that explicitly in, in, for example, in verse, I mean, in many places, but for example, in verse 38 of Uludunapadu, he says, um, um, he refers to ego there as, um, as, um, as vine mudal. Vine mudal means the doer of action. Uh, what he says there is, Vine mudal nam ayin, vine payan tui pon. If we are a doer of action, we will experience the resulting fruit. Why is the ego a doer of action? Because as ego, we identify ourselves with the body and mind. So whatever actions are done by the body, speech, or mind are experienced by us as I am doing this. I am talking, I am thinking, I am sitting, I am walking, whatever. So all the actions of body, speech, and mind are experienced by us as actions we are doing. So doership is there so long as there is ego. So the doer of actions is nothing but ego. So if we are the doer of action, we will experience the resulting fruit. Vine model R, Andrew, Vine V, Tane Arya, Katrutpum Poi, Karmum Mundrum Karalam. That means when one knows oneself by investigating who is the doer of actions, doership will depart, I mean, the ego will depart, and all the three karmas will slip off. This is the state of liberation, which is eternal. And in, um, in verse, um, there's a verse in, um, in Uludunaptu Anubandam, uh, let me just find it, um, where he says this uh, even more um, emphatically about all the three karmas coming to an end. In verse, um, what is it? Verse, verse, 30, verse 33 of Uludunapdu Anabandam, he says, saying that Sanchita and Agamya do not adhere to the jnani, but prarabdha does remain, is a reply said to the questions of others. That is, it's sometimes said, but the, for the jnani, the, the sanchita and the gamya uh, are both, that is, the jnani does no more agamya, and the sanchita is also destroyed, but the prarabdha remains. So long as the body of the jnani remains, it has to undergo that prarabdha. But Bhagavan says, just as, as none of the three wives, if, if, if a husband dies, none of the three wives remain unwidowed. Know that when the doer has died, all three karmas cease. But then how to experience, we, we see Bhagavan as a body, and that body seems to have a prarabdha. But that is not Bhagavan's prarabdha, that is the prarabdha of that body. For Bhagavan, he no longer identifies that body as I, so he, for him there is no prarabdha. <coughs> <coughs> So why it is sometimes said that the prarabdha remains for vijnani is people mistake vijnani to be the body, but vijnani seems to be. And for that body, yes, there is a prarabdha. But since vijnani is not that body, vijnani doesn't experience that prarabdha. But 
That's why he says it for the, to the questions of others. That means people who are not ready to understand, uh, who are not yet willing to understand his teachings as they are, which is that the doer is nothing but ego, and all the three karmas, uh, the, the ego is what does a gamya, and the fruit of a gamya is uh, what is experienced as prarabdha, uh, who the, both the doer and the experiencer both are only ego. So when ego is destroyed, all the three karmas come to an end. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, actually, I'll answer your question in a minute. I'll just ask, answer one more question um, from the list of questions, um, because otherwise they build up and... Um, um, Rahul has, has, has asked, um, my question is regarding self-inquiry and awareness, watching awareness method. Uh, it is explained that, he says, and I think this is according to that so-called awareness, watching awareness method. Notice the awareness that is looking out through your eyes. Now shut your eyes and notice that you are still aware. It is the same awareness that a moment ago was looking at the room. Now with your eyes still closed, observe your awareness. When you're observing your awareness, just remain with that. No need to do anything else. Awareness is empty, so there is no object you're trying to observe. It is just awareness being aware of itself. Also, it is no special kind of awareness. It is just your ordinary everyday awareness that you normally go through the day with, looking at itself. Practice. Notice your awareness, observe that awareness, turn your attention away from world, body and thought and towards awareness, watching awareness. If you notice your thinking, turn your attention away from thought and back towards awareness, watching awareness. So my question is, is it the same as self-inquiry? Can I follow this method? Um, yes, essentially this is the same as self-inquiry, but um, the the way it's expressed is not as clear because awareness, what is aware? Who is aware? I am aware. So Bhagavan focused on I because the uh, awareness is not something other than ourself that we are to watch. It is, it, yeah, okay, he says awareness watching awareness. It's more direct to say I watching myself or I watching I. Um, it's not wrong what is said here. The only thing that is not when it is said that it is no special kind of awareness, it's just your ordinary everyday awareness, that is partially true and partially untrue. That is, our ordinary everyday awareness is what Bhagavan calls sutaribu. Sutaribu means awareness that is, it literally means point, or showing awareness or pointing awareness. So awareness that is uh, displaying things. That, is, that means basically transitive awareness, awareness of anything other than ourself. That, Bhagavan said, is not real. Real awareness is sutatra arivu, arivu that is devoid of, uh, of showing. That is awareness that is not aware of anything, but just aware. Um, so pure awareness is not aware of anything. The awareness that is aware of things is ego. So long as we are aware of anything other than ourself, we, are, we, have, we have risen and are standing as ego. When we turn our attention back towards ourself, yes, it is the same awareness, but it, it ceases to be the sutaribu, the awareness of object, and it becomes the pure awareness, which is the real. Awareness is real. The pure awareness alone is real. Awareness of objects, as Bhagavan says, it's agnana. It's... Uh, that, that is this, what Bhagavan says in verse 13 of Uludhanaptu is very applicable here. I was uh, just reading that verse 13 a short while ago. Um, that is um, where he says, oneself who is awareness alone is real. But the awareness that is real is not the awareness of things, but the pure awareness. Oneself who is awareness alone is real. Nana vamyanam agnyanma. Awareness of multiplicity is ignorance. So, so long as we're aware of anything other than ourself, that is ignorance. So it, it is, but even that ignorance, which is unreal, does not exist except as oneself who is awareness. 
and he get, then gives the analogy of, of the ornaments and gold. So the ego, which is a, what is aware, which is the awareness of multiplicity, is not other than the real awareness, just as the ornament is not other than gold. The ego is the form, the substance is, uh, is the pure awareness. So uh, there, there is a distinction between uh, uh, awareness of uh, objects and, away, and pure awareness, but the distinction is not a distinction in substance. The substance is one. The appearance, the form is different. Gold, is, uh, gold has no form. Awareness has no, uh, pure awareness has, has, is, is not limited in any way. But when it uh, becomes awareness of things, it is then limited. And we are aware of things only when we are aware of ourselves as a body. So that uh, that which is aware of other things is that which is aware of itself as I am this body. So in other words, it is ego. So ego is not other than pure awareness. The substance of ego is pure awareness. But as ego, it is something different. The, the, sn the, the snake is nothing but a rope, but the rope is not a snake. Likewise, pure awareness is not ego, the awareness of many things, but awareness of many things is not other than uh, pure awareness. So we need to recognize this distinction. But as far as practice is concerned, yes, in effect, being self-attentive means we who are awareness are watching ourselves who are awareness. So yes, it is awareness watching awareness. That's one way of expressing it. Um, but uh, Generally, the clues given by Bhagavan are simpler and more practical and also go, if we understand Bhagavan's teachings, it's deeper than the, this person who, who writes a lot, who, who, who coined this term, awareness, watching awareness. He writes a lot about it and the, clue, the practical clues he gives are by and large correct. But the, he's, because he's not gone so deep in the practice, he's uh, many of the subtleties he's missing it's a rather it's a, it's it's not an incorrect way of saying it but it's not going sufficiently deep enough uh, that way of expressing it but yes so long as you're following those clues so long as you're attending only to that which uh, again another problem with the, talking about awareness watching awareness awareness can mean many things when we are when what we are to attend to is only self-awareness, not awareness of other things. Now I have an awareness of um, the table and the chair. So long as I'm aware of the table and chair, that, aware, that is not pure awareness. So what we, the awareness we're trying to attend to is the pure awareness, awareness that is aware of nothing other than itself. So we, we need, yes, we start off by trying to be aware of, of who am I who am aware of all these things. But as we go deeper and deeper, the awareness of other things drops off and pure awareness alone remains. So <clears throat> what, what is the person who, who coined this term, awareness, watching awareness, is someone, another person called Michael. What that Michael explains is not incorrect. By some of the things he says are a bit um, not, quite, uh, not quite correct. But general, generally, the clues, what he says is general, by and large uh, correct. But it's not, um, you can get deeper and more practical clues by studying Bhagavan's teachings than by uh, reading what he writes. I, I don't say what he writes is wrong, but it's not, uh, it's not, um, it, they, 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 there's more to it than what he says. There's more depth and subtlety. It's not more complicated, more depth and subtlety. What is it, what is it that is now aware of, uh, when, when we look out at the world, the awareness that is looking out through your eyes, what is that awareness? That is I. So what is this I? Who am I who am aware of all these things? We're turning our attention back towards ourselves. So in, a, in essence, what he's saying is, is, is okay. Um, and so you ask, please explain both methods. Well, essentially they're the same. I mean, so awareness, watching awareness, if understood correctly, means self-attentiveness and self-attentiveness is the practice of self-investigation so they are one and the same and therefore the results are one and the same but the explanations aren't always so the explanations given by michael langford are not always so deep
as the explanations given by Bodhi. And sometimes some of the things I read, some things he wrote, I can't remember now what they are, but some things he he's a bit goes a bit wrong in his understanding. So I hope that adequately answers that question. Um, the next uh, question is um, Ash. You had your you have your hand up. Hi, Michael. Thank, thank you so much for all the hours that you've spent uh, answering the, these questions. Um, so just, just very quickly, um, I come from a Zen background. So is it possible to do self-inquiry with your eyes open or um, is it necessary for your eyes to be closed? Do you have to completely... Um, do, you, do, you, do you exist when your eyes are open? Yeah. You exist when your eyes are closed? Yeah. You could, whenever you exist, and whenever you are aware of your existence, you can do self-inquiry. Mm. Well, not, not, not in sleep, because there's no, no one there to do the self-inquiry. That is, what is to do self-inquiry? is only, It's only as ego, but we can investigate ourselves. So in sleep, what remains is just pure self-awareness. So there's no uh, attention. What is required is attention. Attention is a, is a selective use of our awareness. We're now, when we rise as ego, we're aware of multiplicity. Mm -hmm. So you can be attending to what I'm saying, or you could be listening to some sound out the window, or you could be thinking some other thought where you're going on holiday. So what you attend to is up to you. Yeah. So long as you're aware of multiplicity. In sleep, we can't attend to anything because there's no multiplicity. We're aware of nothing other than ourselves. But in a state where we're aware of multiplicity, we can attend to this or we can attend to that. Everything we attend to, they, they, we can attend to one of two things, either ourself or something other than ourself. Generally, we're attending to things other than ourself. What we need to do is to attend to ourself. Um, when we're attending to ourself, if you're really attending to yourself, you won't know whether your eyes are open or closed, whether you're sitting or standing or anything. So yes. long as you're aware of my eyes are open or my eyes are closed, your attention is only is at best only partially on yourself, it's partially on these other things. We are trying to focus our attention more and more keenly on ourselves. And the more keenly we attend to ourselves, the more other things receding from the background of our awareness. And when we focus our attention keenly enough on ourselves, we won't be aware of anything other than ourselves. That is the state of pure awareness. That is the state in which ego is destroyed. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that's really clear. Thank you. I just, 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 just very, very quickly. One more, one more tiny question. When, when you're, when you're doing self inquiry, I often find myself, um, I often find myself getting very bored. Um, is it, is there any way to counteract, counteract that? Because, uh, the, it's the, quite board, the boredom is nothing but your Vishaya Vasanas, your yeah. taste, your liking, your inclination to be aware of other things because of the strength of our Vishaya Vasanas, we always want to pop out and to attend to other things. The reason the Vishaya Vasanas are, uh, what gives the Vishaya Vasanas, the Vishaya Vasanas have no strength of their own because they are inclination. So we are the one who give the strength to be in Vishaya Vasanas. They appear strong because we are not yet willing to surrender ourselves. Because, of our, because we are still unwilling to let go of everything else. We, we give strength to the Vishaya Vasanas, our inclination to attend to other things. But mm. by more and more turning our attention back towards ourselves and trying to cling to self-attentiveness, the Vishaya Vasanas slowly, lo slowly lose their strength. So as time goes on, you will find yourself more and more content just to be as you are, just to be self-attentive. The discontent you now feel is because of the strength of your Vishaya Vasanas. So to overcome them, the only way is more and more practice. Yeah, thank you. We, 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 that is why, why we find attending to ourselves boring and we want to pop out again because of our wrong discrimination. We wrongly believe we uh, obtain happiness from things other than ourselves. By experiencing the shares, we think we experience happiness. Yeah. Because when we desire to experience something, that is whatever gives us pleasure those things give us pleasure because we have a light we have a desire for those things so supposing you get pleasure from um reading books on philosophy or thinking about certain things or 
um, whatever it may be, whatever type of, wherever you get pleasure, when you, when you experience that thing, because you have a desire for it, you get pleasure from it. But that pleasure, that pleasure doesn't actually come from that thing. Mm, yeah. how, you, how we seem to experience pleasure as a result of certain vishayas, because we have a desire for those vishayas, that is, throughout the day, I'm, my mind is occupied with so many things I don't like. I want to come home and I sit down and read my book on philosophy or something. And when I read the book on philosophy, oh, I'm free of all these worldly worries. So you get pleasure from reading that book on philosophy or maybe Bhagavan teaching or whatever. You get pleasure from that because of your desire for that. So long as you were engaging in other things in the world, you were, you were discontented. When you come and you sit down and start reading your philosophy, you're, you're, you're happy for a little while. I'm just using this as an example. Mm. Mm. But that happiness doesn't come from the philosophy book. It comes from you because you had desire to read that philosophy book. When, once you start reading it, you'll feel contented. So yeah. we think we attain, obtain happiness from the shares, but actually we don't obtain happiness from anything other than ourselves. The happiness that we seem to obtain from other things is coming only from within ourselves. Happiness is our real nature. When our mind is agitated by desire, we, we, we are taken away from our real nature. When, we, when a desire is satisfied, it may be a material desire, you may want to be rich, when you work hard and earn a lot of money, you get a million pounds in your dollars or whatever it is in your bank account, you feel happy. What, it's a happiness in that when you see on the number, when you look at your bank account on your computer screen and see a one with six zeros behind it, is the happiness in the one or in the six zeros? Where does it lie? It comes only from within you. Because you had that desire to see that one million in your bank account, when you see it, you're happy for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then you think, but this can, money goes very quickly. It's not, not, it, how long is this million going to last me? If I need, a, I need at least 10 million, then I'll be a bit more secure. And you go on working, working, you get your 10 million, you're happy. And then you're dissatisfied again, you work on, work on until you get your 100 million. I mean, this again is just an example, but, but the, the mind is never satisfied with anything other than itself. Whatever pleasure you experience, you may have a craving for sexual pleasure, for example, when you experience it, oh, it's very nice. But again, the craving comes back because the nature that is Bhagavan said, we have never seen any bottomless pit as bottomless as the pit of desire. However much you try to fill that pit of desire, it will never be filled. And somewhere else he uses another analogy. He says the nature of desire is such, but before the object of desire is attained, it appears to be Mount Meru. It's a big mountain. When the object of desire is attained, it becomes like, a, like a, um, uh, an atom. It becomes insignificant. So when, before, you before you earn your million dollars, it seems to be a big achievement to have a million dollars. Once you get a million dollars, that's nothing. It's $10 million you want. So <laughs> desire is never, never satisfied because what we all desire, as Bhagavan says in the very first paragraph of Nana, he says, um, what we all desire is um, Sakala Jiva Galum, Dukum Embadindri, Epodum Sukumai Iraka Virumbadalam. Since every sentient being, uh, or since all sentient beings want or like to be always happy without misery. So we want happiness untainted by misery. In other words, we want infinite happiness. Why do we want infinite happiness? Because our real nature is infinite happiness. So in, we cannot be satisfied by anything less than uh, infinite happiness. Whatever happiness we seem to derive from, from having a lot of money or from reading philosophy books or from watching cricket or football or um, engaging in politics or whatever we derive pleasure from, it's all fleeting. It's all uh, insubstantial, uh, that, that temporary uh, relative happiness. It's not infinite happiness. So we cannot be satisfied by anything other than infinite happiness. And since infinite happiness is our own real nature, the only way to be infinitely happy is to know what we actually are. Nothing else will satisfy us.